There is a myth about Sumer's beginnings and the Nephilim of Nibiru. The prologue of Gilgamesh, Enkidu and the Netherworld, the epic poem, is the primary source of information about the Sumerian creation myth. It briefly accounts for the creation process, starting with Namu, the primordial sea, and concluding with An, the Sumerian name for Anu, the sky and earth, Ki. After An and Ki mate, Ki gives birth to Enlil, the god of the wind. While Enlil splits An from Ki and seizes control of the earth, An carries off the sky. It is not always clear from the Sumerians that An refers to the god An or the heavens, because the two words were synonymous. According to Sumerian cosmology, heaven consisted of three domes covering the flat earth, each made of a different precious stone. Reddish stone was considered the material for the outermost and highest dome. The Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago now owns the Sumerian clay tablet that originally depicted Inanna and Ebi. The Akkadian poet Enheduanna wrote the 184 Lina Sumerian poem Inanna and Ebi, also known as Deity of the Fearsome Divine Powers. It narrates the tale of Mount Ebi, a mountain in the Zagros mountain range, and Inanna, Anne's granddaughter. Anu makes a fleeting appearance in a poem passage where Inanna begs him to let her destroy Mount Ebi. Anu forbids her from attacking the mountain, but she defies his warning and assaults Mount Ebi, destroying it. The story of Inanna's seizure of the Iana temple in Uruk is told in a highly fragmented but significant way in the poem Inanna Takes Command of Heaven. Inanna bemoans the fact that the temple is outside of their territory in their first conversation with her brother Utu, and she resolves to take control of it. At this point in the story, the text gets increasingly disorganised as it describes her challenging trek across the marshland to reach the temple and a fisherman giving her advice on what to do. When Inanna eventually makes it to Anne, her haughtiness surprises them, but they acknowledge her triumph and give the temple to her. A hymn honouring Inanna's greatness closes the poem. This myth might represent the power loss that the Nibiru and An priests in Uruk went through. The East Semitic equivalent of Inanna Ishtar, the daughter of Anu, attempts to court the hero Gilgamesh in a scene from the Akkadian Epic of Gilgamesh, written in the latter half of the second millennium BC. Ishtar angrily ascends to heaven after Gilgamesh rejects her and informs Anu that Gilgamesh has degraded her. Anu questions why she is complaining to him rather than going straight to Gilgamesh. Ishtar vows that she will open the underworld's gates and bring the dead back to life so they can eat the Adapa's illusion about the Nephilim influence. Anu notices that the south wind ceases to blow towards the land for seven days in the legend of Adapa, which originates from the Kassite period. He asks his shuka, Ilabrat, why? Ilabrat replies that Adapa, the priest of Ea, the East Semitic equivalent of Enki, in Eridu, has broken the south wind's wing. Adapa is warned by Ea before he departs that the food and water the gods offer him are poisoned and should not be consumed. Anu insists on calling Adapa before him. Arriving ahead of Anu, Adapa informs him that he broke the wing of the south wind while fishing for Ea, and that the storm the south wind caused sank his boat. Dumuzid and Ningishzida, Anu's doorkeepers, support Adapa. This infuriates Anu, who then commands the Nephilim to reward Adapa with food and water for immortality instead of death. Adapa, however, heeds Ea's counsel and turns down the dinner. Scribes loved the story of Adapa because they saw him as the founder of their profession. Multiple versions of the myth have been found through Mesopotamian history. It has been suggested that the story of Adapa's appearance before Anu is similar to the later Jewish account of Adam and Eve found in the book of Genesis. Yahweh drives Adam out of the Garden of Eden in the biblical story to stop him from eating the fruit from the tree of life, just as Anu forces Adapa to return to earth after he refuses to eat the food of immortality. In the same way that Adapa was regarded as the archetype of all priests, Adam is presented in the book of Genesis as the model for all humanity. Era returns to Nibiru with Ishum. In the epic poem Era and Ayum, written in Akkadian during the 8th century BC, Anu gives the Sebetu, or personified weapons, to Era, the god of destruction. Anu orders Era to use the Sebetu to massacre humans when they become too numerous and noisy. Tablet Y. 
a myth associated with the so-called Kumabi cycle, primarily based on a Hittite translation, mentions Anu as one of the gods. It is part of the Hurrian cultural milieu and is primarily set in Mesopotamia and Syria rather than Anatolia. It tells how Anu was Alalu's cupbearer and how Alalu was the king in heaven in the past, but it doesn't explain the origin of either god. Nine years later, Alalu was forced to flee to the underworld by Anu, who had overthrown him and removed him from his throne. But after nine more years, Kumabi, the scion of Alalu, his own cupbearer, attacked Anu to take the throne. When Anu tried to flee to heaven, Kumabi bit off his penis. Anu mocks Kumabi for this. Ryan Morhen compares Teshub's birth from Kumabi's split skull to the Greek myth of Athena. It is known that Teshub eludes Kumabi's attempts to murder him. After swallowing Anu's genitalia, Kumabi becomes impregnated with Anu's son, Teshub, called Taruna in the Hittite translation, and two other deities, Tashmishu and the Tigris River. Nora Romney hypothesized that a yet-to-be-discovered myth from Mesopotamia that depicts a confrontation between the two may have had an influence on the Huro-Hittite tradition about the conflict between Alala and Anu. Eudemus of Rhodes, an Aristotelian student whose writings have only survived as quotations from the 6th century CE Neoplatonist author Damascius, describes a lineage of deities resembling Enma'ili and, by extension, Anu. The Babylonians disregard the first barbarian principle while accepting Tauth and Apason without further discussion. As I understand it, the rational world, or Moimis, is the single child that descended from the two principles. Anos, Illinois, and Aios were born of them, and they make Apason the husband of Tauth, whom they call the mother of the gods. Aios and Dork's son Blos is known as the Demiurge. From them came another generation, Dake and Dakos, a third generation from the same pair, Kisarg and Asoros. Though Eudemus did not live long enough to read Barossus's works, Barossus can be ruled out as the identity of his informational source still needs to be discovered. Finally, there is a difference between Eudemus's account and the mentioned Babylonian work. Additionally, the fact that Enlil, Ililos, was mentioned as equal to Ea, Aos, and Anu, Anos, suggests that the source was similar to Enma Elish, but not the same. Some scholars have proposed that the series of divine interventions described in the Kumabi myth served as the model for the Greek creation story in Hesiod's epic poem Theogony, written in the 7th century BC by a Boeotian poet. According to Asher Benowitz, Hesiod did not always follow the Kumabi tradition, and it's probable that similar themes from the ancient Mediterranean shared cultural milieu, koine, led to the development of the two myths. Similar to Kumabi in the Hurrian tale, Kronos, the son of the primordial sky god Uranos, overthrows and castrates Anu in Hesiod's poem. Then Kronos' own son Zeus removes him from office. In one Orphic myth, Kronos bites off Uranos, just as Kumabi does Anu's genitalia. That being said, Robert Mondi points out that Uranos was less important to Greek mythology than Anu was to Mesopotamia. Instead, Mondi refers to Uranos as a pale reflection of Anu, noting that he has very little significance as a cosmic personality at all and is not associated with kingship in any systematic way, aside from the castration myth. Late antiquity saw writers like Philo of Byblos attempt to impose the dynastic succession framework of Hittite and Hesiodic stories on Canaanite mythology. Nevertheless, these efforts were difficult and went against the common Canaanite belief that El and Baal ruled concurrently. One of the Anunnaki, Enki, was the Sumerian god of water, knowledge, jestu, crafts, gasham, and creation, undimmed. Scholars who study the Canaanite religion, later called the Ea, Akkadian, Assyrian, Babylonian, religion, associate him with Ia. Greek sources translated the name as Aos. Originally the patron god of Eridu, his cult eventually influenced the Canaanites, Hittites, Hurrians, and other people in Mesopotamia. He was linked to the constellation Ax Iq, the field, square of Pegasus, and the southern band of constellations known as the Stars of Ea. 
From approximately the second millennium BCE, he was sometimes written as the numeric ideogram for 40, sometimes called his sacred number. Mercury was identified with Enki in Sumerian times, and Mercury was associated with Babylonian Nabu, the son of Marduk. Numerous myths about Enki have been gathered from various locations, ranging from the coast of the Levant to southern Iraq. He was well known from the third millennium to the Hellenistic era, and is referenced in the oldest cuneiform inscriptions found in the area. The Sumerian term En, translated as Lord, and originally granted to the high priest, has unclear origins. The common translation is Lord of the Earth. In Sumerian, Ea means the house of water. It has been suggested that this was originally the name of the shrine to the god at Eridu. Ki means earth, but there are theories that Ki in this name has another origin, possibly king of unknown meaning or Kur meaning mound. The name Ea is supposedly Hurrian in origin, while others claim that his name Ea is possibly of Semitic origin and may be a derivation from the West Semitic root, meaning life, in this case used for spring or running water. It has also been proposed that Abzu, rather than Enki, was the first non-anthropomorphic deity at Eridu. The temple's foundation was built into the Abzu, the aquifer's underground waters, following Enki's revelation as Ninhursag's divine lover and the divine conflict between Abzu and the younger Igigi divinities. There are variants, like Elil, for some Sumerian deity names, like Enlil. Ea is probably the Sumerian short form for Lord of Water, since Enki is a water god. En means Lord, and E means Temple. In Abzu, Ab also refers to water, the main Enki temple at Eridu was called Eabzu, also called Iengurha, or House of the Subterranean Waters, situated near the ancient Persian Gulf coastline. In southern Iraq, it was the first temple known to have been constructed. At the site of Eridu, four different excavations have revealed the presence of a shrine that dates back over 6,500 years, during the earliest Ubaid period. The temple underwent 18 expansions over the next 4,500 years before being abandoned during the Persian era. This led Thorkil Jacobson to speculate that Abzu was the original god of the temple before Enki progressively took on his characteristics. According to Ryan Morhen, Enki served as a high priest or divine consort to a goddess, possibly Ninhursag, in the early era before becoming the dominant figure. There was a fresh water pool at the entrance to the Enki temple, and many carp bones were discovered during excavations, indicating communal feasts. Carp are depicted in the twin water flows that flow into the later god Enki, implying that these features have existed for a long time. Given that all later Sumerian temples had these characteristics, it is possible that this temple set the standard for all later Sumerian temple construction. All rules laid down at Eridu were faithfully observed. Enki retained the gifts of civilization, the divine powers known as Mi. He frequently wears the divine horned crown. Situated close to Basra in modern times, Eridu is a stronghold city of Enki, situated at Tel Abu Shahrain, an archaeological site in southern Mesopotamia. Based on the Sumerian king list, Eridu is traditionally considered the oldest city in southern Mesopotamia. Situated approximately 12 kilometers southwest of the prehistoric Ur site, Eridu was the most southern of a group of Sumerian cities that grew up around temples, nearly within sight of one another. Enki and his spouse, Art, were the city gods of Eridu, Damkina. According to legend, Enki, who later went by the name Ea, founded the city. Since Abzu is considered the aquifer that gives rise to all life, Enki was thought to reside there, hence the name Iabzu for his temple. According to Sumerian temple hymns, Asira, Asira, was another name for the temple of Ea Enki. The temple is constructed with gold and lapis lazuli. Its foundation on the nether sea, Apsu, is filled in. By the river Sipar, Euphrates, it stands. O Apsu, pure place of propriety, Asira, May thy king stand within thee. Near Ur, Urnamu, the ruler of Ur the Thur, built a sanctuary for Inanna of Eridu, and Ur Baba, the ruler of Lagash, 
built a temple for Ishtar of Eridu. It is believed that Ur-Namu also documented the construction of an Ishtar of Eridu temple at Ur, which was reconstructed. Eridu was also the name of one of Babylon's religious districts, which housed the temples of Anunitum and Asagil, among others. Founded in the sea, Eridu is among the earliest settlements in the area. Around 5400 BC, in the early Ubaid era, though it is now roughly 90 miles inland, it was near the mouth of the Euphrates River and the Persian Gulf. According to excavations, the city was established on a virgin sand dune site devoid of prior habitation. The city was inhabited until the Neo-Babylonian period, with possible pauses in occupation during the early dynastic III and Akkadian Empire periods. However, in later times, the site was primarily used as a cultic site. No traces of the earlier construction were discovered because the excavators claimed that the Uri III ziggurat and related buildings were built after the earlier structure was destroyed and used as levelling fill. Two early dynastic three palaces had an enclosure wall at a small mound one kilometre north of Eridu. The palaces were built with plano convex bricks laid in a herringbone pattern, a common technique during the early dynastic period. They measured 45 by 65 metres and had walls that were 2.6 metres wide. The site covered about 12 hectares, or 30 acres, during the Ubaid era. In the Ubaid levels of the site, 12 Neolithic clay tokens, the ancestor of proto-cuneiform, were discovered. The incomplete ziggurat of Amarsin, c. 2047-2039, BC, supports 18 mudbrick templars stacked on top, at this location. Levels V through I belonged to the Uruk period, while levels 19 through 6 were from the Ubaid period and were the original Nephilim. Significant Urukera habitation was discovered, featuring non-secular buildings in soundings. The discoveries from Uruk included ornamental copper-topped copper nails, cone and gypsum-coated terracotta cones, two lion statues made of basalt stone, columns several metres in diameter, and a large amount of pottery from the Uruk period. During the early dynastic era, there was an increase in occupation and the construction of a monumental palace measuring 100 metres by 100 metres. At Eridu, an inscription belonging to Elulu, a monarch of the first dynasty of Ur, about 2600 BC, was discovered. A statue of Enmetana, the early dynastic ruler of Lagash, c. 2400 BC, bears the inscription, he built Abu Pazila for Enki, king of Eridu. Eridu flourished during the Ur III dynasty from the 22nd to the 21st centuries BC. Bricks with inscriptions such as Urnamu's from his ziggurat titled Urnamu, King of Ur, the one who built the temple of the god Enki in Eridu, provide evidence of royal building activity. The appointment of an unpriestess, high priestess, of the temple of Enki in Eridu, the highest religious office in the land at that time, determined the year names of three or three rulers. In the first two instances, it was also used as the name of the following year. The 28th year of Sulgi, year the Sita priest who intercedes for Sulgi, the son of Sulgi. The strong man, the king of Ur, the king of the four corners of the universe, was installed as en priest of Enki in Eridu. In the eighth year of Amarsin, Year Enunikiaga Marsin Enune, the beloved of Amarsin, was installed as N priestess of Enki in Eridu. Ibisin, 11th year. Year the site priest who prays piously for Ibisin was chosen by means of the omens as N priest of Enki in Eridu. The year named after Nuradad, ruler of Larsa, year the temple of Enki in Eridu was built and texts from Ishbi Era and Ishmidagan, rulers of Lhasa, indicating control over Eridu, are proof that the site was occupied and active during the Isin Lhasa period, early 2nd millennium BC, following the fall of Ur III. Bricks with inscriptions from Nur Adad's construction have also been discovered in Eridu. This continued during the Old Babylonian era, when Hammurabi, in his 33rd year, year Hammurabi the king dug the canal, called Hammurabi is an abundance to the people. The beloved of An and Enlil established the everlasting waters of plentifulness for Nippur, Eridu, 
Ur, Larsa, Uruk and Isin, restored Sumer and Akkad, which had been scattered, overthrew in battle the army of Marie and Malgium, and caused Marie and its territory and the various cities of Subartu to dwell under his authority in friendship. One of the epitaphs of Kassite dynasty ruler Kurigalzu I, c. 1375 BC, reads, The one who keeps the sanctuary in Eridu in order. An inscription from Sealand's second dynasty ruler, Simbar Ship, c. 1021-1004 BC, mentions a priest of Eridu. Eridu received Andararu status, literally a periodic reinstatement of goods and persons, alienated because of want to their original status. From Sargon II, the Neo-Assyrian king, 722-705 BC. Brick inscriptions evidence that Nebuchadnezzar II, the Neo-Babylonian king, 605-562 BC, was built at Eridu. The Hazem is a naturally occurring hill roughly 15 miles long and 20 feet deep in a basin. It is a sandstone ridge that divides Eridu from the Euphrates. The az sulaibiat depression, previously known as Kor en Nejif, basin turns into a seasonal lake, Arabic Sebka, from November to April when it rains. The Wadi Kaniga's discharge fills it during this time. The Hama marshes are located next to the lake's eastern edge, Id Edin Eriduga, Nunki, the canal of the Eridug Plain linked Eridu with the Euphrates River in the 3rd millennium BC. The river subsequently changed its course. The canal's path passes through several low cliffs where later burials and surface pottery from the 2nd millennium BC can be found. John George Taylor, the British vice council in Basra, started excavation at the site in 1855. Bricks with inscriptions were among the discoveries, allowing Eridu to be recognised as the location. Next, R excavated the primary site. 1918's Campbell Thompson and H.R. Hall, 1919, also surveyed the town's surroundings. Hall made the fascinating discovery of a piece of synthetic blue glass, which he dated to around 2000 BC. Before this method was developed in Egypt, cobalt was used to achieve blue. Under Fuad Safar and Seton Lloyd of the Iraqi Directorate General of Antiquities and Heritage, Excavation was resumed in 1946 to 1949 to find direct evidence of the Nephilim, or Anunnaki. Among the discoveries were a lizard-type figurine similar to those discovered in a sounding beneath the Royal Cemetery of Ur and a terracotta boat model from the Ubaid period, complete with a socket amidship for a mast and a hole for stays and rudder. Soundings in the cemetery revealed around a thousand graves, all dating from the end of the Ubaid period. Temple Levels 66 and Zlitsaigand. They discovered a series of 17 Ubaid period temples that superseded one another and a Ubaid period cemetery with 1,000 mudbrick box graves facing southeast. The Nephilim temple was initially a square of mudbrick measuring 2 by 3 metres with a niche. It was rebuilt at level 11 and eventually reached its final tripartite form at level 6. 300 square metres were built as the base of a ziggurat in Ur the three times. As stated by A, eventually the entire south lapsed into stagnation, abandoning the political initiative to the rulers of the northern cities. According to Ryan Moorhen's findings from these archaeological digs, direct evidence was found and sent to the King of England, which increased the biblical research of the Middle East. The Nephilim temple was found to be abandoned in 600 BC, during his visit to the site in 1990, Ryan Morhan discovered two areas of Nephilim presence and giant bones, likely Amorites, that the previous excavators had missed. When Franco D'Agostino visited the site in October 2014, before the excavation's restart, he noticed more evidence to support this. An Amar Sin brick with inscriptions on the surface, directly referencing the Nephilim burials. A collaborative Italian, French and Iraqi team of the Universities of Rome, La Sapienza and Strasbourg reopened the excavations at Eridu in 2019, determined to get the evidence back to Europe and put it in museum vaults for private research. The Nephilim tablets were from 2600 to 2100 BC, rulers Ianatum to Amar Sin, and were part of a library. Chiod from Rome's La Sapienza University claimed to have discovered 500 early dynastic historical and literary cuneiform tablets on the surface at Eridu, disturbed by an explosion. 
When Iraq's State Board of Antiquities and Heritage visited the location, they discovered stamped bricks from Eridu and nearby locations like Ur, but no tablets. Furthermore, no one had been permitted to excavate on the property. Petinato then reported that they had discovered 70 bricks with inscriptions on them. The modern Eridu doghouse was constructed with these stamped bricks. Bricks from Lonard Woolley's destroyed expedition house at Ur were used to construct the dig house, exactly described in the 1981 Iraqi excavation report so that future archaeologists would know. The ancient Mesopotamians were familiar with the bright star Canopus, which stood in for the city of Eridu in the Three Stars. Around 1100 BC, each Babylonian star was listed on the MUL Apin tablets. The name of Canopus was Mule. From the most southern city of Mesopotamia, Eridu, there is a good view to the south. So about 6,000 years ago, due to the precession of the Earth's axis, the first rising of the star Canopus in Mesopotamia could be observed only from there at the southern meridian at midnight. The Babylonians translated Nunki as Star of the City of Eridu. This was still the case 60 years later in Ur. More information about how the gods selected Eridu and Alulim as the first cities and priest kings can be found in the flood myth tablet discovered in Ur. The tablet's English translation is as follows. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers are shown as flowing into each of Enki's shoulders in the infamous Adder Seal. Two trees stand beside him, signifying nature's masculine and feminine facets. He's seen sporting a cone-shaped hat and a skirt with frills. A bird of prey swoops down to land on his extended right arm. Enki is portrayed in this way to reflect his function as the god of life, water and resupply. Enki was described as the lord of the Abzu, Apsu in Akkadian, the freshwater sea or groundwater found within the earth. He was revered as the master shaper of the world, the god of wisdom and all magic. Abzu, the begetter of the gods, is a slumbering, inert being who finds his peace disturbed by the younger gods, so he sets out to destroy them in the later Babylonian epic Enuma Elish. Enki, his grandson, who has been selected to symbolize the younger gods, cures Abzu by casting him into a deep sleep, trapping him underground. Therefore, Enki takes on all of the Abzu's roles, including his ability to fertilize as Lord of the Waters and Lord of Semen, and establishes his residence in the depths of the Abzu. Reeds were an important local building material used for baskets and containers. Reeds were collected outside the city walls, where the sick and dead were frequently carried. Early royal inscriptions from the 3rd millennium BCE mention the Reeds of Enki. This connects Kur, the underworld, from Sumerian mythology, with Enki. An even older tradition holds that Namu, the mother goddess of the primordial creative matter, portrayed as having given birth to the great gods, was the watery creative force that existed before Ar Enki and was the mother of Enki. Benito states, with Enki, it is an interesting change of gender symbolism. The fertilizing agent is also water. The Sumerian A or Ab, which also means semen. In one evocative passage in a Sumerian hymn, Enki stands at the empty riverbeds and fills them with his water. Legends. This is an impression of a cylinder seal from the reign of Akkadian king Sharkalishari, c. 2200 BC. It features an image of the long-horned water buffalo Enwith and the central inscription, the divine Sharkalishari prince of Nibiru, Ibn Sharam, his Nephilim servant. The origin of disease and life. The Hieros Gamos, a sacred marriage in which divine principles in the form of dualistic opposites came together as male and female to give birth to the cosmos, was a popular cosmogenic myth in Sumer, in the epic Enki and Ninhursag. Enki, the lord of Ab, or freshwater, also the Sumerian word for semen, resides in the paradise of Dilmun with his spouse. The land that Dilmun inhabits is a clean and pure place. There is brightness and cleanliness in the land of Dilmun. In Dilmun, he who is alone lays down his head. The area beyond Enki is tidy and well lit. Enki heard the cries of Dilmun's goddess Ninsikil and had the sun god Utu bring fresh water from the earth for the place even though it was a place where the raven uttered no cries and the lion killed not, the wolf snatched not the lamb, 
Unknown was the kid killing dog. Unknown was the grain devouring boar. Consequently, her city reaps from the abundant water. Dillman takes a sip of the abundant water. Her wells of bitter water have miraculously turned into wells of sweet water. Grain and crops came from her farms and fields. Observe how her city has evolved into the home of the land's quays and banks. Dilman was identified as Bahrain, whose Arabic name means two seas, where the Arabian aquifer's fresh waters mix with the Persian Gulf's salt waters. This mixing of the waters, called Namu in Sumerian, was recognised as Enki's mother. The following story is akin to the biblical account of the forbidden fruit and describes how fresh water revives arid land. After fertilising his consort Nin Hursag, also called Ki or Earth, Enki, the water lord, caused to flow the water of the heart, and after nine days being her nine months, the months of womanhood, like good butter, Nintu, the mother of the land, like good butter, gave birth to Ninsar, Lady Greenery. He met Ninsar, Lady Greenery, after Nin Hursag, the water lord, left him. Enki then seduces and has sex with her, not realising she is his daughter and that she reminds him of his missing consort. After giving birth to Ninkura, also known as Lady Pasture or Lady Fruitfulness, Ninsar once more abandons Enki. Enki finds Ninkura while he is alone and seduces her once more. As a result of their union, Ninkura gives birth to Uttu, also known as the Weaver or Spider, the Weaver of the Web of Life. Enki gives in to temptation a third time and tries to woo Utu. Utu is upset about Enki's reputation and goes to Ninhursag for advice. Ninhursag, upset about her spouse's promiscuous and wayward behaviour, tells Utu to stay away from Enki's home and the riverbanks which are likely to flood. In a different version of this story, Ninhursag plants Enki's semen on earth, which quickly sprouts into eight plants after taking it from Utu's womb. Isimud, his servant and steward with two faces, said, Enki, in the swampland, in the swampland lies stretched out. What is this plant? What is this plant? His messenger, Isimud, answers him, My king, this is the tree plant, he says to him. He cuts it off for him and he, Enki, eats it. Enki eats the other seven fruits despite the warnings. He becomes pregnant ill with swellings in his jaw, teeth, mouth, hip, throat, limbs, side and rib after consuming his own semen. The gods seem to be dying of swelling and have no idea what to do. Disappointed, they sit in the dust. Enki does not have a birth canal through which to give birth. Ninhursag's sacred fox then fetches the goddess and the fox asks Enlil, king of the gods, if I bring Ninhursag before thee, what shall be my reward? Giving birth to gods of healing for each part of the body. Abu for the jaw, Nanshi for the throat, Nintul for the hip, Ninsutu for the tooth, Ninkasi for the mouth, Dazimua for the side, and Enshagag for the limbs. Ninhosag yields and absorbs Enki's ab, water or semen, into her body. The final one, Ninti, Lady Rib, is a pun on Ninhursag's title, Lady Life. Consequently, the story is a metaphor for how life is created on land by adding water and how plants require water to bear fruit once grown. It also advises moderation and accountability, never going overboard. Later, the Hurrian goddess Kiba was given the title Ninti, which also means the mother of all living and was the title of Ninhursag. This is also the name given to Eve in the Bible, known as Hawa in Hebrew and Aramaic, who was created from Adam's rib. This title is an odd echo of the Sumerian myth, which describes Adam walking in the Garden of Paradise rather than Enki. The creation of man. After six generations of gods, the younger Igigi gods, the sons and daughters of Enlil and Ninlil, go on strike and refuse to carry out their duties of maintaining creation in the seventh generation, Akkadian Chapati, or Sabbath, of the Babylonian Enuma Elish. The gods assemble in fear as Abzu, the god of fresh water and co-creator of the universe, threatens to wipe out the planet with his waters. 
Enki slumbers Abzu, putting him in irrigation canals and the Kur beneath his city of Eridu, while promising to help. However, the universe is still in danger as Tiamat decides to take control of creation alone, spurred on by her son and vizier Kingu's support and rage over Abzu's detention. Enki, who used Tiamat's consort Abzu for irrigation, declines to assist the gods when they assemble again in fear. The gods look for assistance elsewhere, and if they make the patriarchal Enlil, the god of Nippur, king of the gods, he will solve the issue. Asher portrays Enlil in the Assyrian version, while Marduk, Enki's son, plays the part in the Babylonian version. Enlil sets her tail in the sky as the Milky Way. Her weeping eyes become the source of the Tigris and Euphrates, and she dispatches Tiamat with the arrows of his winds down her throat, building the heavens with the arch of her ribs. Enki, who might have rescued them, is dozing off and is unaware of their cries. So the question of who will keep the cosmos working remains. Enki is presented with his mother, Namu, who is also the creator of Abzu and Tiamat, who brings the tears of the gods and says, Oh, my son, get up from your bed and out of your sleep. Do the wise thing. Create servants of fashion for the gods, and may they bake their bread. Enki then suggests that they fashion humankind, a servant of the gods, from clay and blood. The gods choose to kill King against Enki's will, and in the end, Enki agrees to use King's blood to create the first human, the first of the seven wise men, or Abgalu, Abiitus Water, Gal, Great, Lu, a man, also known as Adapa, with whom Enki would always have a close relationship in the future. Enki tells his mother that he has assembled a group of gods to assist him, producing several good and princely fashioners. So, oh, my mother, there is such a creature as you have named it. Bind the divine will upon it. Combine the centres of the clay covering the abyss. Virtuous and princely fashioners will thicken the clay. Are you the one who creates the limbs? His consort and wife, Ninma, Ninhursag, will labour above. Nintu, the birth goddess, will support your style. O oh, mother of mine, decide what will happen to this baby. The first man created, Adapa, later serves as the king of Eridu's advisor, when according to the Sumerian king list, kingship descends on Eridu. Samuel Noah Kramer thinks there is an earlier version of the battle between Enki and the Dragon Kur, the underworld, hidden behind the myth of Enki imprisoning Abzu. According to the Atrahasis Epos, Enlil asked Namu to create humans. Namu informed him that she could make humans in the likeness of gods with the aid of her son Enki. According to J. Chrysostomo, 2019, Enmerkar recounts in an introductory spell in the Sumerian epic Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata that Enki made humanity speak in a single language. According to other accounts, the spell is a hymn pleading with Enki to accomplish this. In any scenario, Enki facilitated the debates between the two kings by allowing the world to speak one language, which would be Sumerian, the tablet's assumed superior language. Translation by J. Chrysostomo, 2019, based on recent work by C. Mittermeier is, Since there were no snakes or scorpions at that time, since there was no lion and no hyena, there was no fear or trembling, no dog or wolf, there was no competition for humans. At that point, the regions of Subba and Hamazi, the enormous mountain, the sharp-tongued Sumer, the height of nobility, Akkad, the country with the appropriate, and the safe resting land of Martu, Everything on earth and in heaven, the people under protection, all declared in Lil in one language. Enki, the lord of truth and plenty, the wisely chosen lord who keeps watch over the land. The wise choice, the most knowledgeable of all the gods, Enki, the lord of Eridu, changed their speech. Humanity speaks in unison. SN. The following is Kramer's 1940 translation. A long time ago, there was no snake, no scorpion. Both the lion and the hyena were absent. There was no wolf, no wild dog. There was no terror or fear. The man was unopposed. Back then, the regions of Subba and Hamazi, peace-loving Sumer, the vast country of king's orders, Uri, the place with everything fitting, the country of Matu is safe and sound. The people and the entire universe are working together. Enlil spoke in a single tongue. 
Next, Enki, the Lord of Plenty, whose instructions are reliable, the wise lord who is familiar with the terrain, the god's supreme commander, possessing wisdom, the Eridu lord. Altered the speech they were speaking, introduced conflict into the voice of the man who had been one up until that point. The Flood, the creation myth of Sumer. Since the beginning of the tablet telling the story has been destroyed, the causes of the Flood and the reasons why the hero survived are unknown in the Sumerian version of the Flood myth. However, Kramer has noted that, given what transpires in the later Akkadian and Babylonian versions of the story, it is reasonable to assume that Enki's assistance allows the hero Ziusudra to survive. Enlil, the king of the gods, decides to eradicate humanity in the later legend of Atrahasis because their noise keeps him awake. He sends plague, famine and drought to wipe out humanity, but Enki stops his half-brother's plans by teaching Atrahasis how to neutralize these dangers. Every time, Atrahasis orders the populace to stop worshipping all gods except the one accountable for the disaster, humiliating them into giving in. On the other hand, humans multiply four times. Furious, Enlil calls a council of deities and demands that they keep the truth to themselves about his intention to completely destroy humanity. Enki converses with Atrahasis covertly through a reed wall rather than telling him out loud. To save his family and other living things from the impending flood, he gives Atrahasis instructions on constructing a boat. After the seven-day deluge, the flood hero releases a dove, a raven and a swallow to see if the floodwaters have subsided. A sacrifice is offered to the gods upon landing. Enki is accused of thwarting Enlil's will once more, which infuriates Enlil. Enki argues that punishing the innocent is unfair and that the gods have put safeguards in place to prevent future human population growth. This one is among the oldest of the surviving Middle Eastern deluge myths. Enki and Inanna. The story of the young goddess of the Iana temple in Uruk, feasting with her father, Enki, is told in the myth of Enki and Inanna. The two gods engage in a drinking contest. Enki, completely wasted, gives Inanna the entire mez. When Enki asks his servant Isimud for the mez the following morning after waking up with a hangover, he is told that he has given them to Inanna. He sends Gala to retrieve them, upset. Inanna departs in the boat of heaven and returns to Uruk's key without incident. Enki eventually concedes to Uruk and signs a peace accord with them. From a political perspective, this myth describes events from an early era in which Enki's city of Eridu lost its political power to Inanna's city of Uruk. In the myth of Inanna's descent, Inanna consoles her grieving sister Ereshkigal as she gets ready to go see her sister after Gilgamesh and Enkidu kill her husband Gugalana, Gu Bull, Gal Big, and Sky Heaven. If Inanna does not return in three days, she instructs her servant Ninshubur, also known as Lady Evening, referring to Inanna's function as the Evening Star, to seek assistance from Anu, Enlil, or Enki. When Ninshubur approaches Anu after Inanna has not returned, he is informed that he knows the goddess's strength and capacity for self-care. Enki immediately shows concern and sends his Gala, Galatura or Kugara, sexless creatures made from the dirt beneath the god's fingernails, to retrieve the young goddess, while Enlil tells Ninshubur he is busy running the universe. These creatures could be the progenitors of the androgynous, third-sex Greco-Roman Galli, who were significant figures in prehistoric religious rites. In the tale of Inanna and Shukalatuda, Shukalatuda, the gardener Enki appointed to tend to the date palm he had made, discovers Inanna dozing beneath the palm tree and proceeds to sexually assault the goddess while she is unconscious. When she wakes up, she realizes she has been violated and wants to exact revenge on the offender. For protection, Shukalatuda goes to Enki, whom Botero thinks is his father. The father advises Shukalatuda to hide in the city so that Inanna cannot find him in typical Enkian fashion. Enki challenges the youthful, impetuous goddess to learn self-control so that she can be a better judge by acting as the protector of anyone who comes to him for assistance and as the empowered figure of Inanna. She eventually cools down and asks Enki, the spokesman for the Igigi, the Anunnaki and the Assembly of the Gods, for assistance. 
After she makes her case, Enki realizes that justice must be served and offers to assist, revealing the location of the miscreant. Impact. The Iraq Museum now houses a statue of God, Ear that dates back to Khorsabad in the late 8th century BCE. God, Ear, is sitting with a cup in his hand. From 2004 to 1595 BCE, from Nasiriya in southern Iraq, Iraq Historical Museum. Enki and later Ia were occasionally portrayed as men covered in fish skin. This portrayal and the fact that his temple's name, Iapsu, means House of the Watery Deep, strongly suggest that Enki was originally a god of the waters, Oans. Thousands of carp bones, which may have been eaten during feasts for God, were discovered where the 18 shrines were excavated. His worship at Eridu goes back to the prehistoric era in Mesopotamia. His temple was linked, though little is known about it, to the temple of Ninhursag, known as Esagila, which means the lofty headhouse, E House Sag Head Ila High, or Akkadian goddess Esuntas Ila. The name of Marduk's temple in Babylon was also Ikur, Kur Hill, and it pointed to a staged tower or ziggurat, like the temple of Enlil at Nippur, which was energized by spells. This is also implied in the epic of the Hieros Gamos, or sacred marriage, of Enki and Ninhasag above, which appears to be an etiological story about irrigation water from Sumerian A, Ab, water or semen, fertilizing the barren ground. In fact, the early inscriptions of Urukagina suggest that the divine couple Enki and Ninki were themselves the children of An, sky, heaven, and Ki, earth, and that they were the ancestors of seven pairs of gods, including Enki as the god of Eridu, Enlil of Nippur, and Suan or Sin of Ur. The moon at Ur, Nana, Akkadian Sin, who then dispersed throughout the Middle East, also took over the pool of the Abzu in front of his temple, it is thought to still exist today as the holy water font in Eastern Orthodox or Catholic churches or as the sacred pool in mosques. It is possible, but not certain, that Eridu had a significant political influence on Sumerian affairs at some point. In any case, the importance of Ea contributed, as in the case of Nippur, to Eridu's continued existence as a holy city even after it had lost all political significance. Hittite Anatolia's Hattusa's archive and Asurbanipal's library contain numerous myths featuring Ea. Enki as Ea was influential far from Sumer. In the Canaanite film Pantheon, he was equated with El at Ugarit and perhaps Ya at Ebla. He is also known as the god of contracts and is especially helpful to humans in Hurrian and Hittite mythology. Some have proposed that the name Ea derives etymologically from the term Hai, life, referring to the waters of Enki as being life-giving. The god of culture, civilization and wisdom is Enki Ea. In addition, he created man and guarded the world as a whole. This version of Ea is mentioned in passing in the Marduk epic, which honours this god's accomplishments and the close ties between Marduk's and Ea's cult at Eridu. The two are related in two other significant ways. First, Marduk is commonly referred to as the son of Ea, deriving his powers from the father's voluntary abdication in favour of his son. Second, the name of Marduk's sanctuary in Babylon is the same as the name of a temple in Eridu. Consequently, the Babylonian priests revised and modified the incantations initially composed for the e-cult to honour Marduk. Comparably, Marduk's hymns show evidence of giving Marduk characteristics that were originally ease. But as the third member of the triad, the other two being Anu and Enlil, Ea gains a permanent spot in the pantheon. He was given command over the element of water and in this role, he becomes the Shah Apsi, king of the Apsu, or the Abyss. The Apsu was represented as the watery abyss beneath the earth and since the place where the dead gathered, Aralu was located close to the Apsu's boundaries, he was also called Enki, that is, Lord of that which is below, as opposed to Anu, who was the Lord of the above, or the heavens. The religion of Ea was practiced all over Assyria and Babylonia. Temples and shrines have been built in his honor in several locations, including Nippur, Gersu, Ur, Babylon, Sippar, and Nineveh. 
The many titles bestowed upon him and the different guises in which the god appears attest to his popularity from the earliest to the latest era of Babylonian Assyrian history. The consort of Ea Damgal Nunna, Big Lady of the Waters, or Ninhursag, Ki, Uriesh Damkina, Lady of That Which Is Below, was initially on an equal footing with Ea. Nevertheless, she had a role in the more patriarchal Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian periods simply because of her lord. Enki appears to, on the whole, represent pre-patriarchal periods when gender equality was more prevalent in relationships between the sexes. He tries to avoid confrontation in his persona and values persuasion over it. West Semitic and Egyptian deities. Under the supervision of Paolo Mattiai of the University of Rome, La Sapienza, a group of archaeologists from Italy conducted several excavations in 1964, recovering artefacts from the city of Ebla, which dates back to the 3rd millennium BCE. Giovanni Pettinato later translated many of the written materials found in these excavations. Among other findings, he discovered that the people of Ebla had a tendency, following Sargon of Akkad's reign, to substitute Ea, Micaiah, Ishmaiah, for the name of El, king of the Canaanite pantheon, which could be found in names like Mikael and Ishmael. Some scholars explain how the theory may have been misunderstood. Still, others, like Ryan Morhan, remain skeptical of the idea that Enki, in this instance, is a West Semitic Canaanite way of pronouncing the Akkadian name Ea, associated with the Canaanite theonym Yahu, the Hebrew YHUH. William Hallow has also drawn parallels between it and the Ugaritic god Yam, C, also called Judge Nahar or Judge River. In at least one ancient source, Yor or Ya'a was the god's previous name. The first of the seven sages was Ea, then Uanna, Gressist Oans, and then Dagon, 